Shangani Dam, which is a uh, gravity arch dam, um, has a sole purpose of uh, providing portable water, which is uh, drinking water, to the city of Blawai, which is about uh, 270 kilometers from this dam site. Um, the water from here will join with a pipeline from Zambezi. Um, to also augment water in Blawai. So currently, uh, the water demand in Blawai is around uh, 149 megaliters per day. And uh, the yield from Gwaishangani Dam alone will provide about uh, 146 megaliters per day. So we'll be short with about, uh, if my math is correct, about 3 megaliters per day, which will be uh, augmented by water from the Zambes, the pipeline from Zambes. Okay, so I think I can now go on to our dam itself. I said the dam is a gravity arch dam. Uh, by gravity, uh, we mean that uh, it uses its self weight to provide the stabilizing force. It's an arch, which means it's like a, it's, uh, the shape of it of the dam is arch. Roller compacted concrete itself uh, is different from the normal concrete we know. Uh, this one is concrete which when you see is virtually dry and we use uh, roller compactors to compact the concrete. Uh, I will explain further about uh, the technology when we go down uh, to the depth but um, it's the first of its kind in Zimbabwe. Um, the spiritual type is a simple overflow with OG. Uh, the outlets are drop inlets and the estimated volume of concrete which we are going to apply on our dam is uh, 250,000 cubic meters. And um, the catchment area, which uh, if you can just uh, look at that uh, map, uh, it covers as, as far as the midlands, uh, with a total area of about 38,000 square kilometers, which means uh, we are harnessing runoff from that world region, Martin in Black Bay on the map. Um, the gross capacity of the dam is a uh, 691, uh, megaliters, and the life capacity is about uh, 634,000 megaliters. The total height of the dam is um, 72 meters, but the maximum water depth will be about 59 meters. And uh, the total crest length, which means uh, from that uh, picture which you have there, uh, from the upper road to my right to the other bank. That's where we have uh, the crest length of 361. And uh, the spilling section will be just uh, 200 meters. The full supply level of the dam will be at uh, around 906. And uh, the high flood level will be at 916. And I think we'll be more concerned about uh, that high flood level. And at this juncture, I think uh, we should point at the map which is uh, to my left. Uh, marked in the orangish, yellowish color is uh, the high flood level of, uh, of our dam. That uh, map there. So basically, uh, okay, I think I should go. Sorry. Basically, our dam is here, uh, about six kilometers downstream of the confluence of the Gwai and Shangani River. So this is Gwai River, and this is Shangani River. So six kilometers down of this confluence is our dam. So the dam will have a trough, so it will stretch back by 20, 28 kilometers along our Gwai River. And it will also stretch back by a magnitude of uh, 52 kilometers so uh, this marking in, in this orange yellowish color is the high flood level which we have marked, which means uh, it forms uh, the dam reservation. Uh, we have a lot of uh, homestays that are going to be affected, uh, which need uh, resettlement. And the matter is already uh, in the Ministry of uh, Public Works Office to uh, do the resettlement. Uh, other properties uh, will involve uh, roads, and uh, as you were coming in, I think, 
you saw some construction taking place uh, just uh, near those sheds. We are actually constructing a permanent road which will uh, bypass some of the roads which have been which will be flooded by the dam on full completion. So um, we will have a ring road. I think I will have a better view as we go out of uh, how that will go. Oh. But uh, in order to cross uh, the downstream area of the dam, we are going to construct a bridge which will be used by uh, vehicles and uh, pedestrians. And the bridge is shown in that picture, which is a uh, which you see downstream of our dam as the bridge there. Okay, so I think I'll be okay. Okay, so like I said, uh, our dam uh, is for portable water supply on our life. But uh, our dam also has the capacity to produce uh, power with a magnitude of about 10 megawatts. So on that picture, in blue, that darkish blue, and the red pipe which you see on the bottom of the dam, uh, those are the outlet works leading to our powerhouse for generating our power. So the power, we are hoping it will be third the national grid. Um, discussions are still underway on how to use that power. Okay, now I think uh, we can continue with uh, our demo. Um, we have uh, various ingredients of concrete. For those who know concrete, we have the aggregates, the stone, the sand, the cement, the water. So uh, we are very fortunate that we were able to um, to find sources of uh, these raw materials just within our site. We actually mine our quarry from within site. Just as you were coming in, I think you saw huge piles of stones. That's the quarry which we use here. We also obtain our river scent from local rivers. And uh, cement, we get uh, cement from PPC in Blawai. It comes in uh, those uh, mobile trucks. And uh, we, can, uh, we actually, after obtaining our river scent, we screen it here on site using those uh, vibrating screens. We'll come on to the next one. So that's the concrete batching plant, which you also saw when you were coming in. Uh, we have two of these batching plants here. Uh, this one is, the, we, we reference it as the old one. This one is three silos, then we have the other one which is four silos. Uh, for those, uh, we have, for, for the one with three silos, one silo is for cement and the other two are for fly ash. Fly, sorry, fly ash is a cementous, cementous material or it's, uh, it's like cement, it has binding properties. We obtain this fly ash from one. Right. The purpose of this fly ash is to reduce temperatures of our concrete. How do we do that? Let me get a little bit into the science involved. Uh, when you mix cement and water, we call it a hydration reaction, it produces massive heat. So here we are dealing with mass concrete, which is concrete, any, anything which is above a cubic meter, here we reference it as mass concrete because um, it has tendencies to crack when uh, this heat is released. So in order to lower this uh, heat, we substitute part of the cement with this fly ash, such that uh, where cement molecules are reacting with water molecules, then they are now reacting with the fly ash. Therefore, consequently, the temperature is reduced. However, we mix this fly ash at uh, different percentages, since it is very crucial that we shouldn't affect our strength of concrete. Okay, uh, fly ash is not the only material that we use to lower temperatures of our concrete. We also stock our aggregates in cooling sheds. On your way in, you saw uh, these cooling sheds. 
uh, we stock our concrete, our aggregates there, and uh, by the time we mix, we would have achieved um, uh, a low temperatures to a degree of about 10 degrees lower compared to aggregates which are in the sun. We also uh, chill our water before mixing with the concrete. How do we chill? We have a freezer uh, that uh, uh, chills our water to as low as 8 degrees before mixing. Okay. Um, now we can go on to how we have uh, moved with our project. This was some time in 2017. Uh, we were still conducting minor blasting operations. And then from there, we go on to our foundations of, of the dam. Uh, this was uh, clearing uh, the riverbed for, in preparation for placing concrete on the foundation. And uh, this was uh, during concrete placing uh, on the foundation sometime early 2018. And then uh, this is uh, the completed foundation uh, that was end of 2018. Now, in 2019, uh, we began the major operations on the day. In 2019 alone, we managed to reach about 8 meters from the foundation. Uh, that's uh, how we placed our concrete. Um, then uh, this is a picture during uh, concrete placing on the dam. We also do our laboratory test on site. So this is uh, some of our technicians taking samples from the already placed concrete on the floor. Okay. And uh, this is uh, during our uh, concrete placement. Okay. Uh, this is when we are doing uh, what we call grouting operations, when we are trying to stabilize the foundation. I will explain further when we are on site some of those things. Okay. Um, currently, this is where we are with the dam. Uh, currently, we are at 39% complete. When you are saying 39, most people get confused uh, when they try to relate what's on the ground and uh, the 39% that I'm talking about. The 39%, as you will see when we go down, it involves everything that is done on the project, including the site establishment, all the structures that you are seeing here, all the facilities that have been constructed, including um, this boardroom that we are in. It's, it's, it's part and parcel of the 39% completion. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, as far as the establishment is concerned, we are at 100 percent. What's just left for us is construction all the way up. And unfortunately, this year we are not able to do much of the construction because our contractor went back to China. He's Chinese, by the way. He went back to China sometime early January, and uh, he has been held up by the coronavirus. So our contractor didn't return. Although we are conducting minor works uh, with these ex expatriate staff that uh, remain inside. So uh, that's it for us. I thank you. Okay. I think um, I can open room for questions, but I think it would be better if we have uh, more questions whilst we move around and, and tour the project. Personnel. And thirdly, 
what's the recovery plan of the areas that you have degraded, uh, getting the raw materials? Those are the three questions that I have. Thank you for those questions. I think I can address the because you are still here. Um, as our pipeline goes to Lawai, we are going to have um, offtakes along the pipeline route, such that um, those areas uh, along the pipeline will benefit from the water from this dam. However, I have only mentioned the major purpose for the dam. But uh, everyone is very much into consideration along uh, the pipeline route. And, uh, so that's that's uh, extra question. Oh, you are still going to continue, I suppose. I uh, know you can. You can. Mm -hmm. I think I wanted to add some things, but you can quiet. Okay, that's fine. Uh, what was the second question? Okay, in terms of employment, uh, I think I can say we are about 90% of uh, our casual workers or general hand uh, people are the locals from within this area as far as uh, Tinde, as far as uh, Bing. If you try to even talk with our workers, you see that 90% of them are from within Mat North. And then in terms of uh, the skilled guys, our land here is even from this region of, of the country. Okay. And uh, the third question? Recover, land recover. Uh, land recovery is, 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 is part of the contract. Upon completion, we have to make sure that uh, we claim, we reclaim some of the areas that we have uh, degraded. Yes, I, I, I got this, this question. It would be interesting for the people here to understand what goes on there when you are now, where, how are you going to fit in your pipeline, the route it is going to take, so that the, once you conceptualize that, then the people can understand what happens when the water leaves that place, how does it leave, where does it go? I think it will help uh, answer him. Okay. Yeah. The rule. Yes, okay. Uh, going back to the land degra uh, degradation, mm -hmm. I would assume the environmental impact assessment covered all those and the mitigations of the degradations. Sure. And I'm wondering whether that uh, uh, environmental impact assessment would it be available to anyone if uh, you wanted to <coughs> go through it. Okay. Uh, an EIA has been done before construction of the dam. And as we construct, uh, the Environmental Management Agency is also involved in our construction. They often visit here to see how we conduct our operations, not only on the areas which you obtain material, but uh, also about uh, the, the service of our workers on site, they are also concerned. And uh, they have uh, a documentation that they have produced, which mandates us to properly reclaim uh, the areas within the project after construction. And then, uh, about, <coughs> sorry, I'll come to Eva. And about uh, the pipeline, we are saying after power generation, uh, we are going to have uh, a series of pumps uh, pumping the water uh, to Blawai. By the way, it's just against an elevation difference of around 500 meters from this point to Blawai. So there is no other way except uh, to pump the water to Blawai. Uh, I think I may ask uh, my colleague Madam Pala, if she has uh, anything on uh, the pipeline route, but I'm well aware that uh, uh, the pipe will lead to Kaudu Park, where we will have our uh, water treatment there. And I think we can elaborate further on the pipeline route. If you may. On 
the pipeline route, we haven't done any mm -hmm. design yet. But still, we need to do the investigation along the pipeline because the project is in three phases. That is the dam, the pipeline, and the power generation. So we're now in the first one of the, of the project. Then we come to the uh, second that, um, uh, phase. Thank you very much. <coughs> but, uh, earlier on, you mentioned that uh, there are people that are going to move away from the area where the pipeline is going to be laid. According to your feasibility studies, how many people are likely to be affected in, in terms of families along that route? Um, and what is the, the plan in place in as far as the area? Just mentioned that the, the Minister of Lands assist with that. I can just go into a bit of a detail as to the arrangement there. Then we have heard from other spheres that there are projects that are happening within the catchment area that are a threat to the, the program itself. Just to hear from yourself what is the nature of those pro projects, either mining or otherwise, and what has been done by the authorities to try and save the, the, the project. Okay. Um, let me answer it first. Um, I'm not aware of uh, the number of homesteads that are going to be affected along the pipeline route, but I'm very much aware of the number of homesteads that are going to be affected by the dam that we are constructing here. Like she said, the project is in three phases. Uh, my job here is the construction part of, of the dam. So about um, 350 homesteads are going to be affected. Actually, uh, about 350 homesteads fall within the dam reservation. And um, we have done a survey for that where we have determined those number of homesteads. And the matter, uh, although it is the sole responsibility of the Ministry of Lands and the Public Works to now uh, determine when they are going to resettle. But I would like to say, as it stands to us, it's now urgent. Because once we start contract constructing, it means, uh, uh, by some means, the impounded water. Although there is a facility uh, which you will see at the dam that we have uh, incorporated in order that we don't have or we don't repeat a disaster such as which happened at Token Coast. But um, we have all the figures of uh, the properties that are upstream of the dam uh, and uh, how we are going to especially for the services such as the roads. We actually have uh, some plans on uh, how we are going to relocate some of the, the roads and, and, and bridges. Okay. And uh, what was the second question? Um, it's got to do with the, the programs or projects that we are okay. taking place okay. around the, the density. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of projects, um, I'm not aware of anything else uh, outside uh, the construction of this dam that is taking place around this area. I only know of uh, this project that we are, we are conducting. Yes, um, am I correct to say the estimated date of completion or year mm -hmm. was 2023? Uh, actually, the estimated date of completion was uh, 2021. 2021? Yes. Now, how is that um, affected by the absence of the contractor? Um, or how much is the setback? Okay. Apparently, uh, we have been affected greatly because uh, we cannot rush to complete. We have to allow our Congress to set and all that. So, which means uh, our timelines have to be extended as well. My, my question is, are we being held to ransom by the absence of this contractor? 
or can work continue in his absence. We, we, COVID is an experience that uh, is new to the world, and we don't know how far it's going to stretch. If he can't come back in the next year, are we then being set back further by another year? Uh, no, it's not like that. Actually, uh, the, con the contractor is, is, is scheduled uh, to return uh, in January to begin uh, the construction of, to resume the construction of the dam. So, um, we are rest assured that uh, next year construction uh, will be taking place. And also, he couldn't have come uh, during this period of the year because once we start uh, experiencing rains, we, we normally stop construction because we can't have construction when it's raining. So, overall, he's going to resume construction. Let me. Um, I'm just going to go back um, to the environmental side of the story. Um, what I wanted to ask was the community uh, within the, the dam areas, have they been educated in terms of health and safety, in terms of uh, the environmental awareness, uh, in terms of any chemicals that might be used in terms of spillages or anything of that nature? Uh, as you are aware, I'll just give you a typical example of uh, miners that come in and dig holes and then children just start running all over the place and you find that the child died because of uh, lack of awareness of anything. Is there anything in place in terms of that within the communities? Uh, any any okay. safety education? Uh, I would like to be honest with you. Um, apparently, there is none. We, we don't have anyone going to educate uh, people around the area, but it's something that uh, I think we should actually not and, uh, implement when we construct our project. Especially when you plastics, etc., etc. Yeah, sure. It may be ignorant or, you know, maybe then they come over there. Yeah, true. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, I was coming from the side. Okay. Okay, uh, you talked about uh, 350 more states are being affected. And you're saying that they're going to be recycled and going to other places. Have the people uh, been notified about the recyclement and the stuff? Okay. Um, people have been notified <coughs> uh, that they shouldn't uh, construct anything which poses an expense to them. They've since been notified when uh, the survey was being conducted. Because uh, when the survey was conducted, um, a budget was already formed as to uh, the finances which are going to be involved in the relocation. So people have been informed. But um, the Ministry of Public Works um, is mandated again to come back and uh, uh, inform them uh, before they begin the, the resettlement. <laughs> Um, from the activities such as mining and the damage, well, which is going to bring any income, how is the community currently benefiting and how is it anticipated that they will benefit? And that's the first part of the question. And then the second part, animals are also affected, what is being done. This community for years has benefited from the animals in the area. And once there is a lot of activity, these animals will move away. What is being done about that? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the community benefiting, so far their major benefit has been uh, the involvement into our team operations by mere integrating them into uh, our casual labors and uh, the general aid across the various aspects of our project. And also, as, uh, as Zima, we have a mandate to uh, provide uh, what we call social corporate responsibility. We have been helping the, the communities around, especially to revive their roads and some of the bridges around the area, which we use daily. And also we have helped a number of schools around the area with uh, building materials such as the quarry and uh, the river center. 
then to go on to the animals. Um, it was part, it's part of the major plan that this deal is actually going to provide uh, drinking water to the animals. Uh, the environmental management agency, together with the tourism guys uh, who visit here, are actually happy with uh, the construction of this deal because uh, it will actually lure the animals to come and uh, drink from this uh, big thing. Um, just maybe as a follow-up, the quarry that is being mined in other areas is being sold. Is it correct then to assume that it's being taken for free from the community into the day? Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it that way. Because um, this, this project, uh, when we provide a, a dam reservation, we actually mark uh, the facilities which, are, which we will be using. And this all is applied to the government. The, the government actually grants us the area which we will be using for construction of the dam. And upon completion, it will be up to the client with the government whether to uh, uh, just close off the mine or maybe uh, to leave it to the community to benefit from it. But apparently, no one. Is, uh, no one has sold any uh, material from this project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you said the contractor will be coming in January next year, right? Yeah. So when is the new date of completion of the projects that will be completed? The new date of completion um, will be around uh, 2022. Uh, it's not yet uh, final because it will depend on the schedules that we will formulate with uh, the contract. Because uh, as, as you know, as, uh, now it's, 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 now, it's now common knowledge that uh, uh, we are now behind schedule. And uh, we have to discuss with the contractor on how we are going to improve the speed of completion. So it says that by around mid-2022, we will be done with uh, completion. <coughs> Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, some of the things I think we've got to assist him. Uh, he, as an engineer, a site engineer, his responsibility mainly is to do with the, let's call them mechanical works of this dam. Issues like EIA, they come to him to facilitate him doing the job he's supposed to do. Issues concerning the community uh, benefits and so forth actually don't even land on his desk sometimes. Why am I saying this? I would want us to contextualize what he is doing here, what he can answer for, and what must be answered outside his box. The first thing I would like to say concerns him and the contractor is the issue of completion. Uh, you said you are 35 percent, 39 percent, of which the setting up and the logistics, you are 100 percent. Could we know what percentage are you on the actual civils and the construction of the wall and then the pumping, the facility? that you have got. That, that's the first question that I have. The second question that I have, I will apologize for this one because, as I said, when I was last year, I was younger than this gentleman here. Yeah. That wall was supposed to be 70 meters 
because we were afraid that it might flood that bridge on the Kwai River when you pass the Kwai settlement. Yes. All right. I see now it's 72. 72. 72. I see 72. It being 72, the concrete you are now using is 250,000 cubic. When it was 70, it was 300,000 So I'm a little bit lost there. So for now, those are the two questions I would want to pose. As the percentage of completion you have right on the wall and the quantities being used on a 72 versus a 70, which are now less by 50,000. That could be a little bit. But as I said, I haven't been here for many years. So if you could assist. Okay, um, the designs here have uh, has changed quite a lot. This is now, uh, I don't know the time when we were here, I'm not sure. Uh, what was uh, the type of structure that was here in terms of uh, the orientation of the structure? Now it's a gravity arch utilizing roller compacted concrete technology. So um, upon saying that, um, from the calculations that we've done, uh, given the structure that we have on that picture, uh, 250,000 cubic meters is what we got as uh, the total volume of concrete. So I think it's, it's a matter of us consolidating uh, the old uh, design and uh, the new design incorporating this technology and see where this difference is coming from for the 50,000 uh, cubic meters. Yeah, that's the percentage on the In terms of uh, the percentage, uh, the construction of the dam, we divide it into various parts. Like uh, we talk of uh, the dam body itself, we talk of the outlets, the outlets, we talk of the, the spillway section of the dam, and then we talk of the, the establishment. Right now, the outlets are still at zero. The spillway is still at zero. Why? Because we haven't reached that level of construction. And uh, the dam itself, uh, we have uh, placed about 33,000 cubic meters to date. So 33,000 cubic meters out of our total, it, it translates to about, I think, 11% or so, is it? So with the various divisions of the works which we have, if we sum them and divide, that's where we get our percentage condition of 39%. But um, to this board, I'd like to say we have uh, done 11% of the work on the demo itself. If I may uh, come in a bit, does that cover the foundation only or is there any other extra works above the foundation level? Okay, there is uh, this uh, percentage, uh, this 33,000 cubic meters I'm talking about is inclusive of the concrete placed on the foundations. The concrete which we placed from the foundation level to the 8 meters which you are at right now. And also the concrete which we have placed on the downstream of the dam. I think when we go down to the dam you will see we have uh, this, uh, these blocks of concrete which we have constructed on the downstream, which are like they are in upper or they provide an artificial rock, such that when our water, if that spill level plunges, it won't erode uh, the bed level of, 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 of our dam, and it won't cut back. So we have constructed this uh, artificial concrete layer, which is about is it five, five meters thick. So um, all this uh, concrete uh, is part of the 33,000 cubic meters, and it's also part of the 11% of concrete which have placed. And um, the total, uh, everything summed up, we are now at 39% concrete. 
it, I hope I, I well understood the word. Tuvaba mentioned something uh, which I didn't understand. Uh, to do with the, the 70 and the 72 and something affecting Kwai or something along those lines there. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that the Kuma and Kuza affect Angadi, the public in your life, the water spills or something. You know, I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm not a construction engineer. But, but, but yeah, from what he is saying, yeah. I believe the key now lies with the spillway. Oh. Yes, it will control the level of water instead of it going maybe to 65, it keeps it at 74. Okay. That's where the spillway comes in, mm -hmm. to make sure that those areas are safe. Oh, okay. If he wanted to push it up, he mm -hmm. would then have to just push up the spillway oh, okay. and uh, reduce uh, uh, the outflow rate at, uh, when he, he, he gets to a certain uh, flood level. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's there. When he was explaining that, I understood him to me. Maybe I'm putting words uh, in your mouth. Uh, no, that's, uh, I know. <laughs> Can I just come in on the contractor? Uh -huh. Yeah, um, it, it, it uh, was said that um, before COVID, mm -hmm. there were challenges around payment of the contractor and there was money owing to the contractor, which is why they had gone off site. Uh, if this is above your pay grade, then you will just explain to us and we will take it elsewhere. But if the contractor is due to be coming back on site in January, is he coming to a fully paid up bill or not? Then also just try and, and talk us through when actually you started the project and why it's taken much longer than any other dams in Zimbabwe to be finished. Is it because of these logistical challenges of payments? Or what is it? Um. I'm not uh, up to date with uh, payments, but I know that uh, currently uh, the, uh, the client is in the process of fulfilling all the outstanding payments. Uh, somewhere between, from July up to date, uh, the contractor is, uh, is, being, is being compensated for the, the outstanding works uh, that he has already completed, but I'm not aware of, of the amounts and uh, I can't be certain or I can't be 100% correct whether uh, when he retains in January uh, these payments will all have been paid. I'm not sure of that. But what I'm sure of is that he is uh, retaining in January to resume his construction. And the major reason why this project has been dragging is that issue of, of funding as well. Um, fund, funding hasn't been consistent uh, throughout uh, uh, the course of the project. But uh, some weeks back, uh, we were visited by uh, the Minister of Lands, who was also a mandate to finish uh, this project. And by the way, Kwai Shangani is now the, the top priority project in the country. I don't think we will see another project completing before Kwai Shangani. Thank you. But unfortunately, the question that was a follow up, I think Sandra is not agree with it. But I will not stop from asking it. Okay. Uh, you, somebody asked about other mining activities that could be taking place besides the ones that are officially and legally recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been publicized in certain media houses mm -hmm. that there is some gold mining or panning that is taking place around the branch and then mentioning the expatriates that you tell here being part of the mining that is taking place. I know it could be beyond your actually, reach, but... Actually, it's not beyond my reach, but it's, it's beyond my normal. Okay. Uh, then... I, don't, I only know what's happening here. I, to be honest, I don't want to lie. I wanted to ask me follow. anything on the project, I'll answer. I wanted to yeah. make a follow-up on you suggesting that you are more on the technical side okay. than on the other social econo side. Maybe you could be wise in the next official meetings mm -hmm. that you have a person who actually can relate to such issues that relate to community development, mm -hmm. that relate to other related uh, projects that go with the term. Okay. Uh, point, point noted. 
I think also just to follow up on from that, it, it's very important to, to note that 350 households that you're talking about that may have to be relocated were most likely relocated from Kariba. And so this will be the second time for a lot of those families to be relocated. And it needs to be really, we need, as civic society, we need to understand exactly what the plan is for those families. They were never compensated for Kariba. How are they going to be compensated now for Bayashengani? And how do they get their lives back together? And I think because it's dragging, there's also a sense of uncertainty from those communities who we are engaging as to whether they really need to move or whether this is just some talk. Okay. Uh, I think, like you said, uh, we should, uh, within our team, we should involve someone who has our knowledge of how the, the society, the community is going to benefit and how it's going to be affected mm. and it's all those, it's all those answers. I think it's a huge point that we have to note. Okay, okay a, a quick one. And um, I hope it's still within your purview. Mm -hmm. Phase two and three, right, which is the pipeline. Why can it not be done simultaneously with e phase one? Is it uh, merely a question of um, funding? Um, that is uh, point number one. And um, also the timeline that you expect to uh, finish those phases. Bulawayo is in need of water now, right? And then the other thing is, um, if we look at uh, Ikariba Dam, I think uh, if we go back those many decades ago, no one envisaged a, a, a stage where the water would be so low as to not be able to turn the turbines in enough to generate the amount of electricity required. Now, are you forward looking in um, constructing this dam? Um, we don't know what the weather patterns will be like uh, in the next decades to come. But if for any reason, right, um, the dam levels become too low and there's not enough to pump, as we're experiencing with the dams that are supplying Bulawayo now, what contingency is in place? Um, we, like we said, we're from Amanzi Trust and we get um, engineers from all over the world, right, coming to us with suggestions on new technologies. Right now, um, we have taken so long in constructing Kwai Shangani Dam, and they're actually insinuating that there's no need for this dam. The water can be pumped straight from the Zambezi. Now, as a I, you're, you're with Zinwa, so maybe if this is outside your purview, you can take it up with your superiors that there is this concern. Um, but would Zinwa be averse to having maybe direct pumping? envisaging a site, uh, a situation such as when the dam level is low. I know right now it's just as a reservoir, but uh, we don't know what the future holds and with population growth and development growth in, in and around Matebele land, we need to be sure that uh, we are catered for, for the future. Um, I will take it to my superiors, but I will answer you a bit. Uh, when we are designing a dam, we, we mark uh, certain uh, risks of failure to supply. Uh, on this dam, we have what we call the 4% risk level and uh, the 10% risk level. When we say 4%, it means in 4 out of 100 years, we might fail to, uh, to abstract the, the targeted uh, volume of water which we would have stated. We also have the 10% risk level. In 10 year, in, in, in uh, 10 out of 100 years, we might fail to um, abstract the water which we would have stated. The, on this dam, instead of using the 4% risk level, which is about 160,000 uh, megaliters, we are using the, the, the two, 209,000 megaliters is uh, the quantity of water which you can abstract a year uh, when supplying Blawai, which leads us back to the 100, uh, 146 megaliters, which I mentioned earlier, is it? So um, as we construct 
it's, it's, there is a probability that in 10 out of 100 years, we will definitely, oh, I can't say we will definitely, but it's a probability, it's a probabilistic uh, quantity that 10 out of 100 years might fail to supply this uh, quantity of water due to rainfall patterns and all and the analysis which we do. But um, I will uh, raise this with the superiors that uh, what plans are there in place uh, that if we fail, what happens? And also remember, we said we are going to have a pipeline from Zambezi to join with the pipeline from this place. Is the pipeline from Zambezi going to be enough to supply the water when this one is down? It's, it's something that I will have to ask as well. And then my other question was on phase one and two. Um, well, why are they not being implemented simultaneously? Okay. I mean, the construction uh, of the, the, the problem the is, okay, I, this is from, not from my, this is from my own knowledge. The problem is to do it funding. As you can see right now, um, we were failing to construct uh, up to speed. What's more when we have uh, two concurrent projects happening together? However, it would have been wise for us to do these two phases simultaneously, such that uh, just upon completion, water will be available to blow as well. It's another point that we have to note. And um, by the time uh, that may be a visit next time, I will have uh, an answer for that. I will have related to it. Maybe because with the word that you constantly repeat is that of resources. Can you give us an outline of what resources are needed for the current stage or current level into the second phase and into the third phase of the project? The resources that we need is funding. I mean, when, when, when I say, what are the dollar signs? What are the dollars involved? Okay. Uh, this project is a hundred and twenty one million dollar project. Uh, the, this first phase of the project. Um, I haven't seen uh, the bill of quantities for other two phases, but I know for this project uh, it's about uh, hundred and twenty one million US dollars. Uh, that's uh, that is required for, for this project. That's the contract price. For this case. And uh, from that 121 million uh, US dollars, uh, already uh, we have consumed about 39% of it. So the major issue here is just funding because, as you have seen, actually, as you will see, we have all the materials in place. The only material that you might need to buy is cement, otherwise, the stone, the same is here. The fly edge will obtain from money. So what you only need here is, 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 is what about, what about the steel. Okay, and uh, partly the steel, but uh, steel is not like a major driver because uh, on the dam you don't find much. On the dam board itself, there is steel. It's only concrete. Yes. So you, you, you have to have the steel to that's the contract price. Contract price. Yes. And you're saying you have 39% of the construction. Is there a tally in terms of the contract price and the construction value? Uh, yeah, definitely there is a tally because it is 39% uh, completion against what you are taking from the 121. So there is direct relation. So that they make me try and assist him again. It's like I came with him, eh? Okay. Right. Let's get one thing very, very clear. The project in its entirety is involving getting the water from the Zambezi to this place and the uh, building this reservoir here and getting water from here to Bruello and the corridor along from Libizi stretching 30 kilometers 
either side or 60 kilometers blanket, let's call it a 60 kilometer corridor. All that is factored in. Right? When you are looking at the planning and the logistics that go into the realization of that project as the project, this element here is a drop in the ocean. The planning and the, the research that should go into the pipeline still has to be done. I think you all know that the EIA survives for two years, and then it must be renewed. The last EIA attempt that was done, no, when were you last year? How many years ago? That was, uh, was it 2010? 2010. And uh, that 2010 EIA was not completed. Mm -hmm. So you are talking of uh, an EIA of the 1990s, mm -hmm. which was done. Hence, it's null and void now. Mm -hmm. So it's in 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if we are talking about the pipeline, we are talking of a situation where we are going to start from doing an EIA. The lady explained you something, that the designs of the pipeline, not that they were not done before, they were done accommodating the EIA that was done. Now you may find that in that particular area that has been earmarked for the pipeline, something else has occurred. Yes. Maybe there's been a volcano. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something else. Maybe it's a human it's a, a, a settlement which you cannot move. So an EIA has to be done. So directors here, please understand that the task of bringing the project into context as far as the pipelines are concerned. Pipeline number one and pipeline number two, we still have to do the EIL. And with that, the designing he's talking about, you have now to establish the booster stations along the way. Right, that's one thing that I wanted to sort of assist in with that. The planning of that and thereof the funding of it, which will arise from the bill of quantities, which he said he had not seen, yet the updated one is not there. Because the redesigning has not been done. Because the EAA has not been done. So it means definitely there is no way you would be able to throw any figure as to what that is going to cost or any time to what that is going to cost. So that that is we have to start from square one on that one. But the second thing I wanted to assist on is the issue of the completion. He has indicated that the contractor may be coming in in, in, in January. Earlier on he did mention something very critical, that once the rainy season sets in and there is water, I think you noticed, oh, there was a slide, it was a slide, where there is a wall which you are going to see, an old dam. And the, once water flows over that onto the works, where they are working. There's no way they can go in there when the river is flooded. So the Shangani River and the, the Gwai River, they have a certain flood time. That flood time, where are the guys here? I was just thinking if it comes in in January and the, the rains take us to March, that means he's really on the wall is a bit later. But the other things like maybe setting, you know, the pumping station, because more or less is not on the river bed. Those are things that they could do. 
I'm not sure what they are. Maybe they could highlight that, that when the contractor comes, when they flood, we can do one, two, three, four, that they are offshore. Uh, maybe in this way. Otherwise, the coming of the contractor per se does not guarantee you the beginning or the continuation of the war, the demo, which is the critical element in all this. Because anything else can be done. These offices can be here. But as long as that wall does not stand, even if you have got a pumping station, to what use is it? Because the wall is the one that retains the water. And then the issue of communities alone, really it is the job of the directors here. Communities need to be educated on these things. The advocacy on that will never come from his office. It's not their job. They are not specialized in it. Even if they try to do an attempt like they have gone to 350 villagers and told them, you have to move your village, the language he's going to use <laughs> is not the right language to get a buy-in from those people. You are not going to expect me to go in and tell those people that. I'm saying about him because I know I cannot do it. The way we are trained in doing certain things, the language differs. He had the expertise of people who will counsel, people who will advise, who will advocate, it lies in the hands of the directors here. And they please take that up and they start now to educate the community. Take what is there from the communities and they educate him. Mm -hmm. Like the bridge, that when he completes that wall, the bridge must be up. Because now we are walking across here. From Pasha to Neruko over here, we don't have issues. From uh, Dubindi there, Kavule, going across the two uh, we have no issues, we walk. But now you are building this water body that is going to block us. That road there, why crossing to Livindi, I'm sure it's going to be underwater from when I'm looking at that thing. So, this is the information you give to civil society. Society comes back with the demands. Say, where is the bridge going to be? So it's an integrated process whereby no one is working against the other, but everybody is working together. Thank you. That's what I wanted to sort of comment that it lets put the thing in context. Maybe just to add uh, in short uh, to um, the chairman, the invest, potential investors we have engaged, we have engaged with them, and what is attractive is that combination pipeline from Zambezi to Guayashangani, the reservoir of Guayashangani and the pipeline to go there and possibly beyond. Without that configuration, you reduce the attractiveness to invest in one. Two, the other issue for us as material and collective has not been only the technical EIA and feasibility, but also to look at the empowerment of the communities along the corridor from uh, Nilibizi, through Guayashangani, Guayashangani, it was those communities that are now in that corridor, 60 kilometer corridor, will need to be able to understand what's coming their way, how they are going to embrace it, and putting those communities that are already there first, without a flood from everywhere else, uh, of people coming and taking advantage of that empowerment. So that work is also its own feasibility, we civic society will have to play their role and other um, organizations and institutions while the technical guys get on. But there is no reason that we could not already signing an investor agreement. The delay that we are seeing is a delay which we cannot explain. Investors are chomping and then want to be already coming. And the pipeline could already be beginning with it. The pipeline from Milibizi to Guashangani or the pipeline from Guayashangani, depending on which one is prioritized. 
in short, I think that's it. But I think it's important for us to get on the ground now.